If you have your Bibles, I want us to go to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. Feel free to look in the table of contents if you're not less spiritual. Praise God. I didn't pick a very hard one like Nahum. Nahum, praise God. Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. And once you find it, say amen. And as I was waiting on the Lord this morning, I just felt the Lord put in this word in my spirit. Now last Sunday, um, I left after I finished after finish, uh, bringing the word here. Uh, took off and went to Newcastle. Uh, we made it, got, got there in plenty of time at the airport and got to Newcastle. And, and, uh, and God is really doing something really powerful down there in Newcastle. Uh, Pastor Asha uh, did, I uh, think they did a conference, a two-day, three-day conference. And, and something just broke out in their church. And so they felt to continue with the meetings. And, uh, and so they've been having uh, meetings um, every Sunday night. Uh, I don't think they're doing anything during the week, but every Sunday night they've been having different speakers uh, coming in. And let me just say this, I felt and I sensed uh, such a spirit of revival in that place. And I felt that this, we, we are in a season right now in the kingdom of God and in the body of Christ where God is actually doing something uh, significant. You know, we're coming into the end of one physical season. But I believe first comes the natural, then the spiritual. As the seasons change in the natural, so do also seasons change in the, in the spirit. And so I feel we need to position ourselves for that which God wants to do. You know, the Bible says in the time of rain, ask for rain. So one of the reasons why we tend to miss what God has for us is, is because we are out of sync with what heaven is doing and what heaven is saying. And I feel that, that the body of Christ needs to come back to that place whereby we begin to awaken ourselves in the prophetic. To awaken ourselves in the prophetic. I believe this end time church of Jesus Christ needs to be a prophetic church. Now the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 that he has built his church and the foundation of what? Apostles and prophets. So the church of Jesus Christ has to be apostolic. Apostolic meaning it has to have the fivefold expression. It has to be a fivefold uh, uh, church. There has to be apostles. There has to be uh, 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 prophets. There has to be evangelists. There has to be pastors. There has to be teachers. To be apostolic is to be to to have the fivefold expression flowing through the church. But also the church has to be prophetic. Not everybody, like I've always said, not everybody is called to be a prophet, but everybody is called to be prophetic. Not everybody is called to be an apostle, but everybody is called to be apostolic. Not everybody is called to be an evangelist, but everybody is called to be evangelistic. Not everybody is called to be a pastor, but everyone is called to be pastoral. We are to be our brother's keeper. And so I feel in my spirit that the Lord is stirring us, stirring something by way of the prophetic. You see, one of the things that the enemy has done is that he has stolen uh, the prophetic nature or the prophetic flow of the church. And when the church loses its prophet, the prophetic grace is uh, uh, when we lose our prophetic grace or the prophetic mantle, we become blind. Because anatomically speaking, the body of Christ, the eyes really represent the prophetic ministry. So the prophetic ministry is the eyes and the ears of the church. And so every time the church is not prophetic, or we get to a place where we can't flow, or we begin to lose our sight, and we begin to get to that place where we are blind, one of the things that happens is that we begin to become out of sync with heaven. A church that is not prophetic, the body of Christ that is not prophetic is out of sync with heaven. Now revival happens, revival comes every single time we find ourselves in a place where we are in sync with heaven. Now what did Jesus say? He said, I do what I see my father do. So everything that Jesus did here on earth was always in sync with what God was doing in heaven. And that's why Jesus told us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. 
the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Let your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. So if we are going to see the kingdom of God coming upon every single place, in our city, in our nation, your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. If we are going to see the kingdom of God coming, then we have to get to that place where we awaken to the prophetic. We need to pray and say, God, open my eyes that I may see. Open my ears that I may hear. Touch my heart that I may perceive. I feel in my spirit that especially in these last days, the church of Jesus Christ must be prophetic. Amen. We must be prophetic. We cannot move by feelings anymore. The thing that wars against the prophetic grace that is over the church is our propensity to go by feelings. Whenever we go by feelings, we will tend to miss out on what God has for us. How many of you know that's true? Whenever people can't see, they will always end up going by what? By feelings. The Bible says that one time God spoke to, 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 to Isaac. And he said to Isaac, Isaac, I want you to release something to, this gener to your next generation, to your children. And he says, I want you to release something. But the problem with Isaac is that Isaac was blind. He couldn't see. And so when Isaac was blind, the Bible, God had given him the instruction. The instruction was that the blessing was to be released on the older son. The blessing was supposed to be for Esau. So what did Jacob do? Jacob the supplanter, that, that's what that word Jacob means, means supplanter. So Jacob came and he put on some fake skin. He put on some goat skin because he wanted to be like his older brother because he, he was a homeboy and his brother was an outdoors man. He slept in the street, you know, in the bush. And, and so he grew a lot of hair to keep himself warm whenever he was be camping out in the trees. But Jacob was always at home. So he was smooth skin, the Bible says. And so he had went and he killed a, a goat, killed a, a, a goat and he put the skin on himself because he wanted to be like his brother. He wanted to be like his brother. And so when God had spoken to his father Isaac and said, I want you to release, it's time for you to release the blessing. So he comes to, to, you know, Esau went out to get some game and uh, uh, so he can feed, feed his, his, his father. And remember, his father says, make me something to eat so that when my soul is satisfied, I may be able to bless you. Sometimes that's how we get blessings from the Lord. Amen. How many of you would like to see the blessing of the Lord over your life? Let me take this little rabbit trail because this may help somebody. Sometimes if you want God to release blessings, you, his soul has to be satisfied. Amen. How many of you know you don't go to a restaurant and leave, leave a good tip if, you didn't, if you're not satisfied? If you're not happy with the service that they, put, that they gave you. Amen. How many of you know that? And so we need to learn to wait on the Lord like a waiter would wait on the Lord. We need to learn to wait on him. We need to make sure that we put before him what he wants. To give him what he's looking for. What does he want? The Bible says he's seeking for those who will what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. So we need to become aware of the, the appetite of God. What does God want? So we don't give him a little bit of crumbs when he's looking for a good meal. Amen. Because sometimes there's certain blessings that cannot be released until God's soul is satisfied. He says, go and make me something that I may eat it. And when my soul is satisfied, I'm going to release your inheritance. And there's an inheritance that God wants to release. Every time we come together on a Sunday, whenever we come to worship God, whenever we come together, the most important thing as a prophetic church that we need to do is to discern what God wants. Hallelujah. Somebody said to discern what God wants. You see, sometimes we can come with everything, our own agenda, our own plans, what we want to do. But what's the most important thing is to discern what God wants. Because when you go to a restaurant, you don't want the guy, you know, the waiter to give you what they want. You want them to give you what you want. They may have a recommendation, the fish is real good this today. But if you want chicken, don't force the, you know, fish on them. That's what I'm talking about. 
give him what he wants. And so we need to come to that place where we learn to wait upon the Lord. Because as we wait upon the Lord and we can discern what he wants. Sometimes he may want us to just linger in worship for a little while. Sometimes he may want us to come and have a prophetic act. You know, sometimes I remember one time back in, back in Kenya uh, uh, in one particular meeting. And this was thousands of people. The pastor said, I want you all to stand up and just go around the building. We were walking along the walls. And we went around the building seven times. And so let me tell you, the following Sunday, there was testimonies of breakthroughs and miracles. Because he was talking about, you know, the story of, of Joshua and, and, and how they went about the mountain and went around the, the, the you know, the city of Jericho and what God did. Sometimes you need to ask, what does God want? And when you know and you can discern what he wants, then give God what he wants. Because until his soul is satisfied, he doesn't release the inheritance. He doesn't release the blessing. And that's what happened even with Abraham. The Bible says that the angels who are going to investigate Sodom and Gomorrah, they walked past Abraham's house. They were not going to Abraham's house, but they were walking past Abraham's house. And Abraham saw them and he said, wait, please don't go. Let me kill a fatted calf and put it before you and make sure that you eat. And the Bible says the angels stopped and they, and they killed the fatted calf. He just didn't give them a tiny little thing like this and, you know, that little leftover here. No. They, he gave them the fatted calf. He put the best in front of him. They killed the fatted calf. And sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to give God the best. Somebody say give God the best. We need to give him the best. And you know when he had eaten and he had satisfied, the angels were satisfied. Guess what? They said, where is your wife Sarah? He said, this time next year, your wife is going to be with child. Now remember, for 25 years, they have been proclaiming and proclaiming and really calling those things that be not as though they are. You know, Abraham, Abraham to Abraham, Sarah to Sarai, you know, Sarai to Sarah. And they were prophesying to one another, prophesying, prophesy. but it was until the angels were satisfied, the bless that's the time when the blessing came. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, give God what he wants. You know, sometimes the Lord may speak to you and he may tell you, he may give you an order. He spoke to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I don't want Ishmael. Give me Isaac. Now, sometimes we may want to give God Ishmael. Praise God. Amen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? God tells you, I want you to give 20 bucks and then you reach in and 10 come up. Oh, this will do, Lord. Amen. We've all been guilty. We always tend to give God uh, our Ishmael, because it's easy to get rid of Ishmael, but not Isaac, the apple of our eye. But God asked for Isaac. And guess what? When he was willing to give God what he wanted, then the ram was caught in the thicket. And not only that, but God also gave him the promises. He, he said, I'm going to fulfill the promises that I actually made to you. Your sons and your daughters, they shall be like the stars in the sky and like the sand on the seashore. Sometimes for us to step into our inheritance in the spirit, we have to learn to honor, to honor the Lord and give God what he wants. Let me just ask you, you, you you've got to say, God, what do you want from me? What do you want of me? What do you, uh, this is something that we need to pray on a daily basis. Say, Lord, what do you desire from us? What do you want from, Lord, let us, we want to bring that, that sacrificial gift. We want to give you what you want. And let me tell you, when he is satisfied, when his soul is satisfied, then that's when the blessings begin to come. And let me just say this, revival is always an after, after effect of us satisfying his soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every time we come to him, before him, we gather before him and we worship him and we come and you give him and we wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall be what? Shall renew their strength. They shall walk and shall not faint. They shall run and not be weary. They shall what? Mount up with wings like eagles. They, it always pays to wait on the Lord. It always pays to wait on the Lord. And there was three levels of blessing. There are those who walk. And the Bible says they shall not faint. There are those who run and not be weary, will not be weary. And then there's the third level of blessing. It says they shall mount up with wings like eagles. 
So whatever price you're willing to pay will determine what you're, you're going to step into. And let me just say this. God wants to release us into those three dimensions of blessings. He wants to release us into those places. Some of us, our walk with God needs to be affected. Some of us, God wants to release acceleration. And some of us, God wants to take us from one glory to one level of glory to another level of glory, from one dimension to another dimension, from one place to another place. That means promotion, going to another level. Hallelujah. But what do we do in order to step into that? Wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. I want you to picture a waiter and how a waiter in a restaurant will wait upon you. That's how we wait upon the Lord. So you let him determine what he wants and then you give him what he wants. Let me tell you, that is the key to breakthrough. Following the instructions of the Lord. So the church that is prophetic is a church that knows how to bring the kingdom of God down. If the church of Jesus Christ can awaken to its prophetic anointing, its prophetic grace. When the Lord begins to open our eyes as the church, we will be able to see what God is doing in heaven. And when we see what He's doing in heaven, we should be able to do it here on earth. We cannot be in sync with heaven until we are prophetic. Jesus said, I do what I see my Father do. Now let me just say, now, and I was, I was touching on this. The biggest enemy to the prophetic grace is feelings. Feelings will fight the prophetic anointing or the prophetic nature of the church. Let me finish this revelation that the Lord gave me with, with Isaac. So Isaac, the Bible tells us, Isaac was blind. So Isaac said, come close, my son. And so Jacob comes and he's wearing, you know, fake, uh, you know, skins of, you know, goat skin. And the Bible says that he reaches out and he feels him. He feels him. How many of you know there's people out there that just move by feelings? You see, if we move by feelings, we will miss God many times. Why? Because every time we move by feelings, we only see things on the surface. We don't know what is underneath. Hallelujah. The prophetic church can see beyond the surface. They can actually see what's underneath. That's why we are not to walk by in the flesh. We're not to walk using our sensual, our senses. We are to walk in the spirit. That means we are to walk in the spirit in the, with what God has done for us by opening our spiritual eyes. So he reaches out and he touches him. And when he touches him, he is touching what is on the surface. Because he's moving by feelings. I'm, I'm going by feelings. And you know what? Many times people who are moving by feelings have come to a place where they have missed God. Because sometimes God may take you to a place whereby your feelings may not feel good. Amen. How many of you know that's, that's true? Bible says when Jesus came out of the water, when he was baptized, he was and the Spirit, he was led by the Spirit into where? The wilderness. How many of you know every time you go through a wilderness experience, it doesn't feel good? And so if we are moved by feelings, we will make decisions based on feelings and remove ourselves from a place where there's an inheritance that God wants to release. Because the wilderness was the place where power was going to be birthed in the life of Jesus. After he had gone through the tests and the trials on the 40th day, the Bible says that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. And then went a fame round about Galilee. Then went a fame round about. He returned in the power of the Spirit. Why? Because the power was birthed in the wilderness. Now, if he had been moving by feelings, like most believers tend to do, if it feels good, it must be God. But what happens is that the enemy can camouflage things because he knows sometimes for us to touch that which God has in store for us, we have to go deeper than just the surface. If we make decisions based on the surface, we will always end up making the wrong decisions. That's why we need to be discerning. Because to be discerning, the Bible says we should know each other after the Spirit. Isn't that what the Bible says? We should know each other after the Spirit. That means we're not walking by in the flesh. 
We don't just know each other in the flesh, but we should know each other in the spirit. That means you can look at somebody who on the outside is full of mess, a, a, a lot of mess, but on the inside, there is a king that is in there. On the inside, there is treasure. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels. But sometimes for us to get to that treasure, we have to dig to get to it. We may have to sell something and buy the land and be able to access the treasure that has been hidden. Many times the blessings of the Lord are hidden, but those things are not hidden from us, but they're hidden for us. The prophetic causes us to be able to see that which God has in store for us. So never make decisions based on feelings. Every decision we make, we have to make that decision based on the Spirit of God. We have to learn to walk in the Spirit. That's why we need to pray and say, God, help us to be prophetic. Because the seasons that we are living in right now, if we are looking at it in the natural, we will be, able to, we will be saying, look at how terrible things are. But let me just say this, in the worst of situations, there is opportunity. And it takes the prophetic to see the opportunity in the midst of chaos. Amen. It's time that we learn to walk in the spirit. Sometimes when we don't walk in the spirit, we are fighting with the wrong thing. We get into spiritual warfare, but our warfare is against what? Flesh and blood. So we are fighting with politicians when we should be dealing with the spirit that is behind the politician. And so a church that is sensual, that only moves by feelings, tends to deal with the surface. The surface is that politician. But the real issue is the spirit behind the politician. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not sensual. They're not in the flesh. But they're mighty through God to the what? Pulling down of strongholds. So when the politician gets up and says a lot of stuff, you can speak to that politician the way Jesus spoke to Peter. You need to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Now you're not dealing with him. You're, Jesus wasn't calling Peter Satan, but he realized there was an influence on Peter that was not God. Why? Because Jesus was not just walking by feelings. He was able to see and discern behind the, what was going on, what's, in the, what's beneath the surface. He was prophetic in nature. He was able to sense this is what is going on. So let's deal with that spirit and deal with that spirit so that we can get things into alignment. So if we can come to a place as the body of Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ, if we can come where we awaken to the prophetic grace, the prophetic anointing that I feel the Lord is releasing, then we will be able to bring the kingdom of God down. That's number one. So that his will is done where? On earth as it is being done where? In heaven. Now what's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the king's domain, kingdom, the dominion of the king. And we need to bring the kingdom of God everywhere we go. Every situation, every job, where you work, in your employment, the place that you're working. You see, sometimes when you're oppressed in that place, it's because the kingdom of God has not come into that place. So the will of God is not being done there as it is being done in heaven. Why? Because the will of a king can only be done in his kingdom. Hello? I said the will of a king can only be done where? In his kingdom. The prime minister cannot make a decision about Papua New Guinea. Why? Because that's not his domain. You can never make the will of the king cannot be done outside his kingdom. So for us to be able to see the will of the king being done, we need to bring the kingdom. That means we may need to subdue. If, if in the olden days, what they would do, especially in the times of Caesar and the emperor, is that they would send soldiers. And the soldiers would go and they would do warfare. And they would subdue that place. And that place became Rome. The will of the king was now done in that place as it was being done in Rome. And that's why in some parts of the world, you can see that they were, you can tell this place was actually colonized by the Romans. Why? Because they put cobbled, you know, stones for streets. The, the infrastructure was like Rome. Why? Because they built those places that they had captured, that they had subdued. They built those places so that when the king came to that place, or the emperor came to that place, he felt at home. 
There was no difference from between that and where he's come from. And that's the job of the apostle. The word apostolos is really somebody that is sent, really as, 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 as somebody that is sent to take over territory, to bring government into those places. And so the apostolic church, the prophetic church, the apostolic church is a church that knows its authority. The prophetic church is a church that knows the voice of the king, that knows the will of the king. And so we need to be apostolic, we need to be prophetic, and we need to get to that place where we can bring the kingdom of God so that his will can be done in that place as it is being done in heaven. So every time you see something on earth, that doesn't line up with, some, with, with what's going on in heaven, then we know that the kingdom hasn't come into that place as yet. So you got to ask yourself, is there a sickness in heaven? No. Why? Because the perfect will of God is done in heaven. Look at what's in heaven. Is there luck? Is there people, you know, depression, suicide, all this sort of stuff? There's none of that in heaven. But when the kingdom of God comes, then his will is done here the same way it's done there. That means the people who are depressed start to get the joy of the Lord. People that are suicidal start to get the will to live. They want to live once again. Why? Because the kingdom of God has come. And when the kingdom of God comes, then God's will begins to be done here on earth as it is being done in heaven. So I believe that God is calling the church of Jesus Christ. To a place where we awaken to the prophetic. We need to go as in the book of Revelation. When he's speaking about that church. Come and, and buy from me some oils. And anoint your eyes that I may give you your 2020 vision. I believe God wants to give us 2020 vision. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let me just share this. Haggai chapter 2. And I'm going to prophetically release this. Because I feel this is a prophetic and now word for, for the church. Haggai chapter 2 verse 4. He says, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. So God is beginning to speak here, and the thing that he's saying to these people, and you've got to understand, he's speaking to Joshua, He's speaking to Zerubbabel and he's speaking to the people of the land. So he's not just addressing leadership. He's not just addressing the up and coming. He's not just addressing the people. He's addressing everybody. So he's speaking about Joshua. He's talking to Zerubbabel and he talks about all the people on the land. And the Bible says, be strong. So in this season and in this time we're living in, especially with everything that is going on, God is calling us to be strong. Hallelujah. We need to be strong. We need to be strong. Now in Ephesians, the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord. Let me just say this. They, those who know their God shall be, shall be strong. How many of you know that verse? You can Google it. It's real. Amen. Those who know their God shall be strong and shall do what? Exploits. So for us to be strong, we need to know our God. And so God is bringing us to a place where we're going to go deeper in our knowledge of Him. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Hearken and listen and yield to your spiritual appetite. When you begin to feel to listen to certain teaching and certain preaching. You know, sometimes I go through seasons where I'm listening to one preacher and listening and listening. And then my appetite changes and I go and listen to another preacher and I listen and listen. And then my appetite, listen to your spiritual appetite. Those who know their God shall be strong in this season. The enemy wants us not to get to, to get to that place where we are disconnected. And let me just say this, with all the lockdowns and, and all the stuff that has been happening, is to get people to a place where they become weak in the Lord. Why? Because he doesn't want us to move in the power of the Spirit. Because the Bible says that those who know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. For us to do exploits, we must know God. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. How do you become strong in the Lord? you got to be a man of prayer. you got to be a woman of prayer. you got to be a man and a woman of the word. 
We need to be people in the word. And let me just say this. If you eat um, one measly meal once a week, guess what? You will die. You will not be strong. After three days, you, that's why we cannot live on yesterday's manner. We need today's, we need to give us this day our daily bread. Hallelujah. Be strong in the Lord. That means we cannot be Sunday Christians. We need to be daily, everyday Christian. God, give me the word for today. I cannot live on yesterday's manner. Yesterday's word was great, but I need a word from the Lord today. Glory be to God. You see, God said to them, you pick up manna and don't keep it for tomorrow. Tomorrow's, maybe if you keep it overnight, there's going to be worms in there. Why? Because God wanted them to push and pursue him every single day. Because his mercies are new every morning. And we need to come to that place where we refuse and fight distractions and things that are trying to take our time. Continue to wrestle and, and, and make sure that you have boundaries that, that protect your time with God. Don't allow your time with God to be taken. Don't be too busy for God. Amen. It's important that we come to that place where we fight to make sure that we have a daily walk with the Lord. For you to be physically strong, you got to have three meals a day. At least two meals a day. Amen. And if you have two meals today, tomorrow at least have three. Amen. I know Jimbo only has one. Praise God. That's why he's lost a lot of weight. Glory be to God. But let me just say this. It's important that we be able to get into the word of the Lord. And not just read the Bible, but press in for revelation. Man shall not just live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let God talk to you through his word. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When I read the scripture, I say, Lord, if I don't hear from you, I'm going to read it again. You know, this past week I was reading 2 Peter chapter 2. And let me tell you, I read it three times. I read it the first time, read it the second time. I wasn't getting anything. But the third time, God began to speak to me. And my heart just started to break. And I started weeping. And I just got down on my knees before the Lord. And I was shaking under the power of the Holy Spirit, repenting and saying, God, oh God, you know, I thought I was walking and serving you and living. But when I measure my life by the standards of the scripture, I fall short. Now, I read it twice, read that chapter twice, and I, he did not bop to me. I wasn't just, it would have been, I'm reading just to check a box. I've read the scripture for today. But I pressed in. I said, God, talk to me. Talk to me. Out of, man shall not live by bread alone, but by everyone that proceeds from the mouth of God. Talk to me through your word. And let me tell you, when I did that, God started to break my heart. You know, every time we think we're doing good, we're living in the, the way that we want to live, you, you, until you see him, hallelujah, then you realize, oh, wretched man that I am. Glory be to God. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The moment you think you got it all together and put it all, everything is, many times it's because we've gone away from God. When you, there is encounters, when you have those encounters with God, it, it highlights things in your life. You remember when Jesus performed the miracle and, and, and peed up through the net into the water and pulled all these fish into the, into, the, into the boat? What did he say? Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. That miracle, I mean, brought conviction into the soul of Peter. Peter said, go away from me, God, for I am a sinful man. There is encounters you can have with God that will bring us to a place of conviction. Let me just say this. Not condemnation. Conviction. There is a difference between conviction and condemnation. Truth without love brings condemnation. Truth with love brings conviction. Conviction is what's necessary for repentance and for transformation. Amen. God always brings conviction. For us to be truly transformed, it always begins with conviction. That's why the Bible says, for when we see him as he truly is, then we shall become like him. When you look at the word and you see him as he truly is, that's where transformation begins. Do not become, you know, the Bible tells us that we are not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we may be able to prove, and it talks about the will of God, the different, you know, that, the, that we may be able to prove the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. 
Because God's will is good, it is acceptable, and it is what? Perfect. For us to get to that place, we have to say, God, speak to me. Speak to me. Fight for that time. Don't allow distractions. Fight for your time and put a boundary around those times. If you've got to switch your phone off, switch your phone off. If you've got to switch off the news and check in to see how many have got COVID in, you know, Victoria. And following the news every one hour, switch it off for that time. And you wait on the Lord until God speaks to you. Give me my daily bread. And let me tell you, when you begin to do this, we're going to begin to see saints who are strong in the Lord. And let me tell you, the moment we become strong in the Lord, that's when two things begin to happen. Number one, we shall begin to do exploits. Miracles begin to happen. Signs and wonders begin to happen. The impossible becomes possible. Why? Because you have come to that place that you know God. Let me tell you, signs and wonders really flow out of a place of knowing God. Hallelujah. When you know Him. When you know Him. When you know Him. There is stuff that is released in your life as the church of Jesus Christ. When we come to that place where we know Him, that situations that we're living in will not hinder us. It will not overcome us. We will be able to triumph even in the time of trials. We'll be above and not beneath. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The power of His might is only available for those who are strong in the Lord. Because power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. If we don't grow ourselves spiritually, and God gives us that power, we will walk around. Hey, did you see that? How many of you know what I'm talking about? And he says, I will not share my glory with no man. How many of you know that in the scripture? So as you grow in the Lord, God can trust you with his power, and his power will not corrupt us. I thank God every time he says no to me in prayer. Because I know that he said no because I'm not ready. The Bible says that even the son, if he's not mature, he is not different than a slave. How many of you know that's in the scriptures? Even the son, if he's not mature, cannot be differentiated from a slave. And sometimes God does not allow us to come into that place of provision until we have come to the place of maturity. So God is speaking to us as the body of Christ to be strong in the Lord, to grow, and to be consistent. The anointing, the presence of God does not increase with the intensity of our prayer, but rather by the consistency of our prayer life. The Lord told me this many years ago when I had a habit of praying on Monday, skip Tuesday, pray on Wednesday, skip Wednesday, Thursday, pray on Saturday. If I'm preaching on Sunday, praise God. And when I used to have that kind of a prayer life, one time the Lord appeared to me in my room. And I, and I remember I was, in my, I was getting ready to do my, you know, uh, my pray on Monday and then skip Tuesday there on a Wednesday. I was in my bedroom ready to pray. And all of a sudden, the ceiling of my bedroom disappeared and a hand came down. And I don't know whose hand. I just remember seeing a white garment. A hand came down. And I remember I was uh, trying to reach, trying to reach, trying to reach. And I couldn't reach this hand. I knew God was asking me to connect with this hand. But I couldn't connect with this hand. And the hand went back and disappeared. And then the Lord spoke to me. He said, my presence does not increase with the intensity of your prayer, but rather by the consistency of your prayer life. And from that day, I was delivered from praying on Monday, skip Tuesday, pray on Wednesday, skip Thursday, because there was no consistency. On Monday, I will pray. Man, I will be wiping sweat. I will get get in there and I will pray. But then I will miss out on my Tuesday prayer time. The Lord said to me, it's not about how intense you pray. It's about how consistent you are in your prayer life. God rewards consistency. Amen. Amen. How many of you know, that's why whenever you have conferences, I was asking Pastor Asha, how is it that you guys have hit this gasha? He said, well, we had three days, four days of meeting. He said, the first day, we just had a normal conference, normal sessions. It felt like a Sunday morning service. He said, the next day, we got together and we started feeling something was shifting. Then the next day, he said, it was even like a weightier glory that just started to come down. Why? Because every time there is consistency, you get deeper and deeper and deeper into the things of the Spirit. And so if we had a 
daily, daily walk with the Lord. When we get together on a Sunday morning, it's going to be like revival. Why? Because it's consistency. But when we go 50% that pray once a month or once a week or, you know, and we're not quite there spiritually, when we get together, we're not in unity. Spiritually, we have not come to that place of unity. And so it becomes hard to really get that traction. That's why whenever you have consistent meetings, let's say you say we're going to have meetings every night this week. Let me tell you, by Friday, people will be slain in the spirit everywhere. Do you know why? Because of consistency. There's something about consistency that causes the presence of God to increase. Why? The Lord said to me, my presence does not increase with the intensity of your prayer, but rather with the consistency of your prayer life. Consistency. Give us this day, our daily, 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 daily bread. How many of you are getting something out of this? So he says, be strong in the, he says to them to be strong. And listen to this. And this is what he's talking to Joshua, Zerubbabel. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start to close with this. He says, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. And work. Amen. Isn't that what the Bible says? It says, and work. Why? Because you've got to do something to remain strong. There's got to be a work that's got to be done. We are not to be strong just to be strong. God is strengthening us for a work that he wants us to do. Somebody say, I'm ready to work. I'm ready to work. I'm ready to work. Amen. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when, I, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Now, let me just say this. He's speaking to them and says to them, listen, number one, be strong, be strong, be strong. And we've seen for us to be strong, we have to be strong in the Lord. Then he says, I want you to work. You got to work at it to be strong. You got to, there's a work to be done. Then he says, I want you to do this because of the covenant that I made with you. The promise that I gave you. So there's a reason why God wants us to be strong. There's a reason why he wants us to work. It is because of the covenant that he gave us. Hallelujah. Why? Because he can never fulfill the covenant until we are strong enough to carry the blessing. You know, years ago, T.D. Jakes preached a message, Can you stand to be blessed? And he was speaking about the weightiness of God's blessing. How many of you know the blessing of the Lord is heavy? Amen. To carry the blessing of the Lord, you got to be strong. you got to be strong. To be blessed, you got to be strong. Because all kinds of stuff will come your way when the, the moment God begins to bless you. Why? Because blessings always brings conflict. The favor of God always attracts conflict. There's no way you can wear the coat of many colors and your brothers don't have an issue with you. Come on, somebody. They may dig you a hole, they may sell you, put you in the hole, auction you off. I mean, they, they never the people don't mind you as long as you are not blessed. But the moment you're driving a better car than them, come on. The moment they see the blessing of the Lord on your life, that's when sometimes stuff can start flying your way. But you got to be strong so that that stuff doesn't move you and doesn't. None of the, Paul said, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. So there's a promise that God said, I want you to be strong because there's a covenant that I made with you when I brought you out of Egypt. For me to fulfill that covenant, you need to be strong. Now, what was that covenant? The covenant is that I'm going to take you into the promised land, the land overflowing with milk and honey. That was the promise. So for them to qualify to step into the blessing of the Lord, they have to be, they have to be strong. They have to be strong in the Lord. Now listen to this. It says, according to the word that I covenanted with you, verse 5, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, and he says, do not fear. Because when you realize, let me tell you, the blessing, like I said, you, every time God blesses you, you have to be strong to carry the blessing of the Lord. How many of you know that when he took them into the promised land, he had already allowed giants to dwell in that land. 
the blessing came with giants. And that's why he says there, do not be afraid. Isn't that what the Bible says here? Look at this. It says, do not fear. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. If I'm to bring you to the covenant, that, to the blessing, the thing that I promised you, the moment you step in there, you will see giants in that land. But you should not be afraid. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Those who are strong in the Lord will not be afraid whenever they come into their blessing and they see giants around their blessing. They realize that God is bigger than the giants that are in the promised land. Glory be to God. They see the bigness of their God rather than the bigness of the giant. The moment the giants are bigger than the God that you serve, you shall become like grasshoppers in your own sight. And God has been working very hard to make you a giant on the inside. Jesus on the inside, shining on the outside. I can do all things through who? Christ, who strengthens me. And so God has been building a mighty man and woman of valor in you. Let me just say this. We need to learn to understand that we have to be strong in the Lord. And when you're strong in the Lord, one of the things that goes is fear. We're not afraid. And so when you step into the blessing, into step into the promised land, and you see the giants that are waiting for you there, you see the challenges that are in the pl pl place of promise, those challenges won't push you back. Many times people have lost their blessings because they were not willing to deal with the challenges that come with the blessing. Now you may say, well, give, a, give me a good example. Let me tell you, if God told you to run for presidency, to become the president of the United States, if you've got weak skin, they're going to be talking about you from morning to night to morning to night. If, if one little comment on Facebook can make you quit and walk away and leave and, and throw away the towel and give up on God, let me tell you, you're not ready. Because every time God blesses you, there will always be opposition. Opposition is only an indication of your strong position. Now let me just, I'm going to finish with this last verse here. It says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land. And this is prophetically the time that we're living in. We're living in the time of shaking. God is shaking. They, 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 we've never lived in a time where the whole world has been affected the way the world is being affected right now. Before, there was things that would happen to this place and that place. But right now, we're dealing with stuff that is happening around the world at the same time. In Australia, right now, we're dealing with plagues of mice. And we're dealing with still everything. Lockdown, can't travel here, can't go there. I mean, it just keeps seeming that there's one thing after another after another. And John Paul Jackson spoke about, you know, about 2011. God showed him a vision of something called the perfect storm. He said the world is coming to a place where it's going to be like the perfect storm. Where everything is going to happen at once. But he said this is going to be an opportunity for the body of Christ. It will be an opportunity. Why? Because those who are in Christ are not in crisis. If you are in the ark, though it may rain, the rain may kill those on the outside, but those who are in the ark, the ark is going to float and go higher and higher and higher. And the thing that is killing them is what is actually causing the ark to go higher and higher and higher and higher until you go from the valley to on top of Mount Ararat. So those who are in Christ are not in what? Crisis. So let me just say this, everything that you see happening in the world, all things will work together for the good of those who are called according to his, to, to his purpose. It will work for your good. It is good. Somebody say it's all good. Hallelujah. So the church needs to understand that the shakings that is happening right now is only to awaken the church because of the opportunities that God is creating for the body of Christ. There are tremendous opportunities at this time. Opportunities to win people into the kingdom. Opportunities to reach people that could not be reached before. Let me tell you, there is an opportunity right now to do great things for the kingdom and to advance the kingdom of God. Because where darkness abounds, the Bible says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. Darkness may cover the earth and gross darkness for people, but my light shall arise, shall shine upon you. This is the time for the church to arise. Not to shrink and hide, but to arise and shine. Somebody say amen. 
So listen to this. According to the word that I covenanted with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake the heavens, shake the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, all nations, all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. I will shake all the nations. The shaking is because God is creating in them an appetite for God that they never had before. Why? Because all other ground is sinking, sinking sand. And on Christ the solid rock we stand. Let me tell you, God is about to open their eyes and they're going to begin to realize we have nowhere else to run but Jesus. Come on somebody. Hallelujah. You see, the ark was a joke until the heavens started rain, the heavens opened up and the rain started to fall. They thought that crazy, that crazy guy, you know, Noah building that thing. I mean, the ocean is kilometers, thousands of kilometers away. Look at this madman. You see, it had never rained from the sky before. God watered the earth from the ground. And so the Bible says that, that as, as these guys, they thought he was a madman until the day the, the Lord himself closed that door and the heavens were open and it started to rain. And let me tell you, when that happened, they could not run to their own homes for safety. The only place they could have run to for safety was the ark. Hallelujah. I pray that it would not be too late for the earth, for the people of this earth. I pray that God will cause there to be thunder and lightning before the rain begins to fall. So that they will hear the thunder and lightning and run to the ark before the rain begins to fall and the door is closed. We pray for the mercy of the Lord that he will shake and shake this earth so that the people of God will begin to pursue God like never before. This is prophetically where I believe we are at right now. He is shaking the nations and is creating in them an appetite for God that they never had before. They will realize there is no safety in your own home. The only way we can run, the only place we can run is into the presence of the Lord. They will begin to ask us, what is the hope of your calling? Why are you so happy when everybody else is depressed? Why are you people so joyful? Be ready with an answer because we're about to see the nations come into Jesus. That's why I said we are living in a time of the greatest opportunity. We will see many people come to know Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm ready, Lord. That's why we need to be strong in the Lord. Amen. He's preparing his harvesters. He's preparing us. Every time we spend time with him, he's putting tools. Like a farmer will put tools in your hands. He's putting sickles in your hand. He's putting tools. Some of you are going to get gifts you've never had before. Mantles you've never had before. There's tools of the harvest that God is releasing in this season to bring in the harvest back into the kingdom. He's preparing us. It says, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. I will fill this temple with glory. Now next Sunday, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what I believe by way of finances, because I believe Part of the revival and pouring that the Spirit of God is about to do, there's going to be a wealth transfer. Why? Because we need that wealth to do what God wants to do. You know what? I take missionaries around the world. The most I've ever taken in one trip was 45 people all to, to, to the Philippines for three weeks to do crusades and win people to the Lord. We saw thousands of people come to know Jesus. But you know what? The number one reason why people cannot go for mission trips is that, Pastor, I would love to go, but I can't afford it. How many of you know that's the truth? I would love to be able to go, but I can't afford it. I can't afford it. And you see, God is about to, re you know, the Bible talks about redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. How do you redeem time? God wants to bring us to a place of fi there's a financial breakthrough that God is about to release. So that we can be able to redeem time. That means we can be able to have time. I'm, I'm going to talk about that next Sunday as the Lord permits. Uh, we're going to have a tag team here. Prophetic Sunday. Uh, tw um, next Sunday, come get ready. We're going to prophesy to every single person here. We're going to believe God for the word of the Lord for your life. Can we, we're going to close here. I think I'll, I'll, pull, I'll put a full stop here. Praise God.
to keep going, but that's another hour.